Good evening. Welcome to the Lunar and Planetary Institute as we continue our 2013-2014 Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. Uh, the universe is out to get us and what we can or can't do about it. Uh, our first uh, presentation a few months ago was about the sun and what it throws at us which is bad, usually. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, asteroid impacts uh, on the Earth. And it's a little bit uh, fortuitous. We actually were supposed to have this talk a few weeks ago, and we rescheduled it to this week, and it happened to coincide with a really cool event that uh, Dr. McElroy will tell you a little bit about you know, here in a bit. Uh, our next presentation will be March 6th, so we're taking a few months off. So don't forget March 6th. We have flyers out front for it. Uh, the topic will be on gamma ray bursts and supernova. Um, and also note, our April presentation was originally the 17th. We have also rescheduled that for April 24th. Uh, so please note that. Uh, we have our email list, sign-up sheet out front as always. We also have some goodies on the uh, table by the, on the other side of the front door for you to pick up and take home. Uh, teachers, if you're with us, we have your professional development certificates uh, at the receptionist desk. Pick up one of those before you leave. And last time we asked you to fill out an evaluation. And so if you could do that again, even if you did do it a few months ago, uh, we'll be walking around with an iPad again. If you want to do it that way, we have paper surveys at the front door, and we can also give you a slip with a URL you can take home and fill out if you want to um, when, you, when you get home. Uh, and don't forget our reception afterwards, of course. Um, and we have a shuttle. I don't know if anybody here needed to take the shuttle uh, tonight, um, but if you did, it will leave here for the last time to go back to the church at 930. So make sure you're on the 930 bus, so to speak, if you need to. All right. So to uh, tell us more about tonight's speaker, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Stephen Mackwell to come up and do that. Uh, Dr. Mackwell is the director of the Lunar Planetary Institute. Thanks, Andy. Um, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, as Andy mentioned, we have uh, an event going on uh, in the building at the moment. Um, it's a, a NASA-sponsored event um, that's here was from started up last night, it's gone going today and then tomorrow morning. It's a continuation of a meeting that we started um, the 30th of September, an auspicious day. We started the meeting, it was supposed to go for three days, it lasted for one, then the government shut down. So 51 days later we started it up again. Um, and. Um, as Andy mentioned, it's kind of a, something of a coincidence because the meeting is all about um, NASA's plans for an asteroid retrieval mission. And so uh, it's rather an interesting and um, coincidence in a way that, uh, that we have David Kring scheduled to speak tonight on the recent Chelyabinsk um, airburst in Russia. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Kring tonight. Um, David is a senior staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute here. Um, one of my scientists, it's a great pleasure to have him around. David uh, did his bachelor's degree at Indiana University um, in geology, uh, moved from there, uh, did his PhD at Harvard University. From there, oh, I should mention that while he was doing his undergraduate work, he was an intern here at the LPI in uh, 1983. So um, he has a long history with the LPI. Um, after he finished his uh, PhD, he moved uh, to, to the um, uh, division of um, the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona and the Department of Geosciences at the University of Arizona um, where he kind of moved up in the rungs to become an associate professor uh, and uh, managed um, the um, Space Imagery Center there. Uh, more recently um, he moved here to the Lunar and Planetary Institute first as a visiting scientist and then decided he liked us so much he stayed um, and is now one of my senior scientists. David um, has a number of accomplishments. Um, I could go through his long, long list of things that he's done and the, the commitments that he's made to the planetary science community over the years. Um, but I'll just mention the awards that he's received. He's a, a fellow of the Meteoritical Society, a fellow of the Geological Society of America. Um, he just recently received the Ron Greeley Award for, award for Distinguished Services that is given out by the Geological Society of America. And he has a, an asteroid named after himself, um, which is quite fortuitous. Um, David is a, an expert on, on impact processes, and most uh, much of the time he's been here, he's been the director of the um, Center for uh, Lunar Science and Exploration um, here, uh, running uh, a group of people working on, on impact processes on the moon. 
Um, but his background is much broader than that, and we're going to hear some of his breadth tonight when he's talking about asteroids. Of course, that's the other part of the impact process, not just what's hit, but what's hitting it. So, with no further ado, I will pass the microphone to David, who's going to talk about the 2013 Chelyabinsk airburst and the hazards of near-Earth asteroid impacts. David. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead and dig in. Um, I want to start with the news of Friday, February 15, 2013. Um, for those of us in North America, you may have been uh, waking up, turning on the radio, and getting the first burst of news. It may have been over lunch when colleagues around the coffee pot said, did you hear? Or it may have been in the evening when you got home and you turned on the evening news. But the headline was, Small Asteroid Penetrates Earth's Atmosphere, or with some news organizations, a little bit more dramatic terminology. Uh, when this impact occurred, uh, the sun was uh, illuminating uh, the eastern Pacific Ocean. Dawn was beginning to sweep westward across uh, Asia as this asteroid uh, made its way uh, towards the Earth uh, and impacted uh, in the early morning hours coming from the direction of the sun. So it was completely unseen, unexpected, and um, as you will see in a few minutes, it startled a great number of people in Russia. Okay, to illustrate um, this trajectory towards the Earth, uh, I'm going to use a video that some of my colleagues in the Czech Republic and the University of Western Ontario produced. So imagine yourself as a space cowboy sitting on top of this asteroid and you're gonna ride it all the way to the Earth. Uh, I am going to uh, stop it though before you hit. Uh, they've asked me not to. So here we are approaching the Earth. We're 48, 41 minutes out. Uh, so we're approaching the Earth very quick. Uh, we're now about 15 minutes out, screaming over uh, Asia, uh, just about to hit. And you can see the impact site just ahead of us uh, on the limb of the Earth. Okay, it went screaming into the stratosphere. Uh, generating um, uh, twin vortices tails behind the object as it was depositing a tremendous amount of kin kinetic energy in the uh, atmosphere. And there was a series of uh, high energy detonations uh, closer to the ground that generated shock waves, which really are the culprit uh, behind the damage uh, that so startled the people uh, in Russia. The um, explosion shattered windows in the region, as you can see here, knocking them uh, inward. Uh, here we see smoke or dust rising where a factory wall collapsed inward and outward. Uh, here is the aftermath of that collapsed wall from a similar perspective. And here's, uh, you can see the debris of the wall that collapsed onto the sidewalk. And fortunately, uh, nobody was caught and buried beneath uh, that debris. A lot of people were injured, but for the most part, thankfully, uh, they were minor uh, injuries. Now, I was showing you a perspective from the outside. I have to say, in these types of events, you are not assured safety uh, on the interior. So I'm going to show you uh, a couple of uh, security films uh, that captured, the, I have to defer to NASA TV. I was asked not to. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was asked not to. I'm sorry. Um, so, so here's a, a video, um, uh, uh, and I'm going to start it, and you'll see a series of uh, security videos that illustrate uh, what people at work, just minding their own business, uh, saw. Whoops, that didn't start quite right. Let me try that again. quite clearly realized that there was something bad going on outside and cleared the room. Very smart of them. Okay, now we're going to see a warehouse. That's a shock wave and an air blast. Here's another office scene. And I like the fact that this gentleman went over to his colleague and picked her up and left. Very well done. Okay. So, so this obviously was a big event, um, but there's a couple of things I want to say about them. These stuff is falling onto the earth all the time. 
Um, and if we step outside on a clear night, you can oftentimes see meteors crossing the sky. These are little dust-sized particles. Uh, so the process of material hitting the Earth is not unique, it's not rare, it happens all the time. Fortunately, most of the debris hitting the Earth uh, is small in size. This is a little diagram that illustrates uh, the consequences of, of different types of material. Here are the meteors that you see burning up in the uppermost atmosphere uh, when they are small dust-sized particles. Larger objects can penetrate deeper uh, to the uh, surface of the Earth. Sometimes they completely uh, catastrophically uh, fragment, so you cannot uh, uh, find any remnants of the object. But sometimes they'll reach the lower uh, atmosphere, completely decelerate, and then fall to the Earth as a single meteorite. Uh, the, more, the bigger objects will generate lots of smoky trails. This is something akin to what Chelyabinsk did. Uh, can have one or more uh, multiple fragmentation or have fragmentation events and shower the ground uh, with a series of objects. Uh, the largest or strongest objects can penetrate the entire atmosphere, hit the surface, uh, and produce a <coughs> hypervelocity impact crater. So, message one is this is a common process. Uh, message two is thankfully we are surrounded by an atmosphere. The atmosphere is a very important shield for those of us on Earth. Uh, as you may recall, for those of you who are a little bit older, when the astronauts uh, were walking on the lunar surface, they were walking on, on a planetary surface without an atmosphere, and even these little micrometeoritic objects were plowing into the surface, creating micrometeoritic impact player, uh, craters that were so energetic they were actually melting parts of the lunar surface continuously. Okay, so thankfully we have an atmosphere that protects us from objects like Chelyabinsk. Otherwise, it would have hit the ground and created uh, some more damage. Okay, meteors are something that you can also see from space. I love this picture. This is captured by some of our colleagues across the street at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, when they were uh, on orbit on the International Space Station, you can see this little Perseid meteor streaking into the upper uh, atmosphere. And I would love to know if somebody saw this very same meteor on the ground. Don't know, but it would be fascinating for it to have been witnessed uh, coming and going. Okay. Not all uh, uh, fragmentation events also come with shock, shock waves uh, and damaging shock waves and air blasts. Uh, so uh, this is an example. These are a few stones from the Portales Valley, Valley uh, event of 1998. In this case, several dozen stones uh, reached the surface of the Earth after uh, witnesses reported hearing multiple detonations and seeing smoke trails. But in this case, the object was smaller the detonations occurred a little bit higher, and there was no significant damage on the ground other than uh, going through the wall of a barn and digging a few holes in the field and roads. Okay, so now let's drill in a little bit more about the Chelyabinsk properties itself. Uh, first of all, the diameter of the asteroid is about 20 meters, 66 feet, for those of you who are used to English units. The asteroid hit the Earth uh, with a velocity of about 19 kilometers per second. That's about 41,000 miles per hour. Most of the kinetic energy was deposited at an altitude of 35 to 25 kilometers above the surface. And the explosive energy of that event was approximately, uh, or equal to approximately 500 kilotons of TNT, which is a fairly substantial number. Uh, the energy of the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II were about 15 kilotons. So this was a big event. Again, fortunately occurred at a fairly high altitude. This event is roughly an order of magnitude more energetic than the Seacoat Aline event of 1947 that also occurred in Russia. It's roughly an order of magnitude less energetic than the Tunguska event of 1908, which occurred in Siberia. Uh, so. Uh, Russia, obviously, is a big continental mass and sees an unusually large amount of these events because of that surface area. Now, I want to actually, uh, it's important to say that the estimates of these past events, the Seco, Deline, and Tunguska, are our best guesses. Um, even Tunguska is a historical event. The records are quite clear on it. But there weren't arrays of devices out there to measure uh, the event. Uh, it was, in fact, only investigated years later. And so 
uh, when we try to evaluate the hazards of future impacts, it's important to understand that our database is really small, okay? And that really underscores the importance of the Chelya Defense Impact Event. It was terrible that people were hurt, but for the first time we had a really good data point that relates the type of damage with the energy of the impact event. Okay, now, when this occurred on February 15th, there was, of course, a lot of discussion as to what hit, uh, uh, what entered the Earth's atmosphere. I've been telling you it's an asteroid, and of course we now know it's an asteroid, but what were the clues that led us to that conclusion? Some of these clues emerged really quickly. Uh, so what I'm showing here uh, are the, is the evidence from the impact velocity, and I am plotting uh, on the y-axis the impact flux as a consequence of the impact velocity. Down here it's in terms of kilometers per second, up here it's in terms of miles per second. Most of the impactors, and this is the follow the gold line, most of the impactors uh, that hit the Earth are asteroids and they have an average impact velocity of 18 kilometers per second. The Earth is also hit by some uh, uh, short period comets. They hit with velocities from about 30 to 35 kilometers per second. And then there's even a smaller number of long period comets that occasionally hit the Earth with velocities of 50 to about 55 uh, kilometers per second on, on average. <coughs> the Chelyabinsk object that hit the Earth on 15 February 2013 had an estimated velocity of 19 kilometers per second, which is this red line right here, which suggests that the object was in fact an asteroid. So that was our first clue. Now, there was a lot of video of this object crossing the sky, and uh, scientists, in fact, people in the public together on lots of continents began piecing together the trajectory of that object through the sky, and then they worked that backward out into space and calculated a trajectory, uh, or an orbit, excuse me, uh, out in space. And I show that result here on this diagram. This is the sun, the orbit of Mercury, the orbit of Venus, the orbit of Earth, orbit of Mars. And the particular orbit I'm showing you is the one that was determined by Paul Chodas at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And you can see that the orbit of Chelyabinsk before it hit the Earth uh, emerged from the asteroid belt. Okay, so this is clue number two, which is suggestive of an uh, origin as an, as an asteroid. Finally, um, not too long after the event occurred, people started reporting stones and, and, and pebbles and so on and so forth that had actually reached the surface and began collecting them. So let me show you uh, actually an example of a Russian citizen, this is not a scientist, but simply a Russian citizen who's very curious about what has fallen in the woods by his home. And he's going to drill in, he's going to show you a little spot in the snow. There's that little hole, okay? Something's pierced the snow. He's going to excavate around that hole uh, and he's going to uncover uh, what is buried uh, beneath the surface scrape it away. Now as it turns out, uh, as these objects pierced the snow, they formed a tube and that tube became icy and they formed these little objects that the Russians call ice carrots. <laughs> and at the bottom of the ice carrots you see these little stones. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. So we have fragments of the object. So now we can take away all uncertainty uh, and in fact analyses very quickly revealed that these uh, are related to a type of meteorites that we call ordinary <coughs> meteorites that we know for a lot of other reasons uh, come from the asteroid belt. And I'll say something more about uh, those meteorites uh, in a few minutes. Now, as I said a few minutes ago, this is a 20 meter diameter object. It's fairly substantial, composed of ordinary chondrite material. Previously, the largest documented explosive fragmentation of an ordinary chondritic asteroid occurred in northwestern Arizona seen here in this red circle, in an area called Gold Basin. That event involved an eight meter diameter asteroid, so something substantially smaller, with a kinetic energy equivalent of five to 50 kilotons of TNT. So something that was significantly, by a factor of 10 to 100, smaller than the uh, event. Nonetheless, uh, it showered the surface with several thousand relics of the asteroid, which uh, we collected over uh, a period of years. And I want to point out but this is actually an event that occurred quite a long time ago. Uh, so we are extracting clues from the geologic record of these types of events uh, over significant portions of geologic time. Now, 
Shelley events was dramatic because it did get low enough in the atmosphere and it contained a lot of kinetic energy and there was the explosion that generated the shock waves and air blasts. Now, it's important to understand that there are actually two sources of the shock waves and the air blasts. The first one has to do with the ballistic flight of that object through the atmosphere. And that's what this first bullet actually addresses. Shock waves are produced by objects moving faster than the speed of sound, i.e. Mach 1. Impacting near-Earth asteroids penetrate the atmosphere with a speed equal to or in excess of 11.2 kilometers per second. That's more than 25,000 miles per hour or greater than Mach 35, which produces a ballistic shock wave. The Chelyabinsk near-Earth asteroid was moving at Mach 60 to 61. Now, a second uh, shock wave is produced by the catastrophic explosion, okay? So that's just like a bomb going off anywhere that produces a radiating shock wave uh, that can reach the surface of the Earth if it occurs uh, above the surface uh, of the Earth. Uh, and those shock waves are accompanied by high velocity air blasts or high velocity winds. Similar effects were measured around nuclear explosion test sites. Uh, this is an example of trees around a, a United States test uh, during the Cold War. And you can see that the uh, shock wave and the air blast actually is picking up a lot of dust, blowing it and, and blending over uh, trees. Now the Tunguska impact event, which I've mentioned uh, once and will refer to again, the event of 1908 was so energetic that when it, uh, the shock wave and air blast encountered the forest in Siberia, it snapped those trees over like toothpicks over uh, a region of about 2,000 <coughs> square kilometers. Okay, now, this is um, a diagram that illustrates uh, the consequence of the shock wave as it radiates from the point of origin. Uh, so this is increasing pressure over pressure and as a function of distance from that origin. And not surprisingly, the shock wave is more intense the closer you are to the impact. And as time progresses and the, uh, the shock wave passes over a, a larger and larger uh, area of the Earth, uh, the energy or the magnitude of that shock wave uh, decreases. Now, let's talk about what shock waves and air blasts have done at some other known geologic events. Uh, the best preserved and I think the most dramatic near-Earth asteroid impact site is Beringer or Meteor Crater in northern Arizona. If you've not been there, you need to go there, okay? It's just down the road from the Grand Canyon. So when you go to the Grand Canyon, make a stop. This is the crater. It's 1.2 kilometers in diameter, okay? Uh, the, the, the guides there like to point out that if you had stood the Washington Monument on the floor of the crater, the, the tip of the monument would just <coughs> reach uh, the rim. Uh, and uh, this was a larger impact event. The object obviously reached the ground, but as I'll discuss a little bit later, the object wasn't that much bigger than the Chelyabinsk one. So that's actually important to keep in mind when you're trying to think about the, evalu uh, the, the hazards of these types of objects. Okay, so let's talk about what, meteor crate, what happened at Meteor Crater. This is a satellite view. It isn't actually, it's a space shuttle view. This is from Columbia. Uh, and here is the 1.2 kilometer crater right here in the center of the bullseye, okay? Now, uh, in small events like this one, it's hard to imagine this is a small event, but in the scheme of things it is, a fireball, shock wave, and air blast are the major environmental effects. This is not the size of event that produces uh, global climatic changes, mass extinctions, or anything of that sort. Nonetheless, the blast effect was immediately lethal for human-sized animals within the inner six-kilometer diameter circle, that circle right there. Severe lung damage uh, would occur within the next 10 to 12-kilometer diameter circle due to pressure pulse alone, and animals would be severely injured and unlikely to survive uh, with that, within that region. Now, winds and, uh, would have exceeded 15 kilometers 1,500, excuse me, 1,500 kilometers per hour within the inner circle and still exceed 100 kilometers per hour at radial distances of 25 kilometers, which is this third circle here. The outermost circle that I portrayed there at 50, kilometer, uh, 50 kilometers represents the outer limit of severe to moderate damage to trees and any human structures of comparable strength uh, to trees. And I say that because at, this at the time of this impact event, 50,000 years ago, there weren't humans in the vicinity and there certainly weren't any houses or anything of that sort. Um, in contrast to what you'll sometimes hear visitors say on the rim of the crater, it's fascinating. 
Okay, now, 15, 50,000 years ago, uh, the landscape was different. Uh, in fact, the climate was different. We had cool, cooler and, and wetter conditions. We actually were in the Ice Age. Uh, the animals that would have uh, adorned the landscape are mammoths and mastodons, giant ground sloths and bears, feeding and browsing and hunting, okay? Uh, you'll see that red circle, that represents uh, where the fireball would have scorched plants and animals up to a distance of 10 kilometers. The yellow zone represents where uh, large animals were killed or wounded by a uh, pressure pulse and an air blast. I mean, for example, imagine the uh, pressure pulse and, and air blast pick going over the landscape, picking up sticks and stones, and basically creating a fusillade or a shotgun blast that would have impaled uh, organ uh, animals living across uh, the surface. So even animals that were wounded and not killed directly uh, may have had a hard time surviving afterwards. Hurricane force winds would have then extended up to a distances of 30 kilometers in all directions, which is represented uh, by that blue uh, circle. Okay. Now, as I said, that occurred 50,000 years ago. There were no humans in the region. Uh, but it's important to note that if <coughs> such an event were to occur today, it has uh, the capability of completely decimating a population of a modern uh, city like Kansas City. So here is an outline of the metropolitan area of Kansas City. Uh, that is the circle represents uh, the zone of severe to moderate damage. Um, anything in that zone would essentially be annihilated. Okay. Larger impact events affect larger regions. Uh, this is a picture of eastern Canada. In the center of the bullseye is a crater called Manicowagan. It's about 100 kilometers uh, in diameter. Uh, and the white circle represents uh, the region over which uh, buildings and structures, if they were to occur there, uh, would have been destroyed. Um, so as you can see, it's a, it's a rather large area over a, a diameter of about 1,100 uh, kilometers. Fortunately, and I've said this once before and I'll say it again, larger impact events occur far less frequently than small ones, which is good. And really good when you start to step up to chicxulub size impact events, which are dinosaur killing uh, impact events, mass extinction style impact events. And fortunately for us, these occur on average only once per 100 million years. Okay, in this case, um, a se severe air blast represented by the uh, red zone flattened, would have flattened any forest out to a distance of about 1,500 kilometers. Gale to hurricane force winds would have extended over the entire southern part of the North American continent as uh, outlined by that uh, yellow uh, circle. Um, in this case, these were actually minor consequences of the uh, impact event. In this case, uh, the impact event was so large it had global uh, effects that extinguished most life on Earth at that time, uh, 65 million years ago. Okay. So this is a little chart to kind of illustrate what I've just said in the last uh, slides. The area affected uh, by the blast uh, increases as the impact energy increases. And so you see several <coughs> things here plotted. There's Beringer Meteor Crater. Uh, there's uh, the Reese Crater in Germany. There's Manicouagan, which I showed you in Canada. And here's the Chicxulub impact event in Mexico that affected uh, the entire world. Shelly events, you can see, is at the extreme small end of the types of events that produce air blast, okay? Um, so at some level, you look at this chart and you say, okay, they're not bad, inconsequential at some level. But it's important to also realize that as the world's population grows and occupies a larger fraction of Earth's surface, events like Shelly events will potentially affect uh, more people. So that is something, uh, I think, to keep in mind. Okay, now, you don't just have to look at, at the geologic past um, to uh, uh, see examples of these types of events. Uh, on, this is a modification of the diagram I showed you earlier. I've actually now put on here the trajectories of several relatively recent events. Uh, here's Chelya events itself coming in rather shallowly, detonating here with a bat blast of 500 kilotons. Uh, just the year before, in 2012, uh, the Sutter's Mill meteoroid detonated over California. How many people remember hearing about that? Okay. That had the uh, energy of about four uh, kilotons. 
And then in 2008, we had another asteroid come uh, whizzing in. This one actually was detected before it hit, and so there were predictions, predictions as to where it would burst, and in fact, it did burst with a one kiloton blast uh, over northern uh, Sudan. Okay, so these events are uh, something that occur on a relatively frequent time scale. Okay, now let's, let's look at the asteroid itself. Okay, we have all these meteoritic fragments of it. Here is a picture just rotated of one of these fragments. It's a beautiful rock. Um, you can see that it is, it's a breccia. What do I mean by a breccia? It, it is a rock that is composed of broken fragments of older rocks. And they are cross-cut by these dark black veins. These veins are material of shock-melted uh, portions of the asteroid that were created in an impact event on the asteroid long before it encountered the Earth, okay? This breciation process uh, probably uh, is responsible for reducing the structural integrity of the meteoroid and uh, made it more susceptible for catastrophic fragmentation in, in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. And this is uh, it's something that's been argued uh, on the basis of other uh, meteoritic uh, materials that have fallen uh, to the Earth. Now, scientists love to take these paper-thin slices through rocks, and this is an example of that through the uh, Chelyabinsk meteorite. Uh, and then we put it on a microscope, and this allows us to see the, the microscopic texture of the interior. And the meteoriticists in the audience are going to be drawn immediately to these circular objects that are scattered here and there throughout the object. These are chondrules. These represent molten droplets of rock, fiery rain that once existed in the solar nebula, this disk of dust and grass, gas that used to circulate around the sun long before planets accreted. Okay? Uh, these chondrules are eventually accreted to form small planetesimals, and those in turn eventually accreted to form the larger planets uh, like Earth. Uh, that material, after it accreted into some a small planetary body, was then affected by an impact event, and it created these dark black channels or, of impact melt uh, that cross-cut the sample. Other parts of this meteoroid are completely black. Okay? None of those white fragments survive. Uh, and those black regions are visible in both uh, the microscopic thin section and actually in whole specimens. This is a centimeter cube. And this material has been severely shock damaged and melted by a pre-existing impact event on the asteroid before it actually encountered uh, the Earth. Okay, now, this is a picture to kind of illustrate the processes that this meteorite, or the, me the parent body, suffered uh, before it encountered the Earth. It came from the asteroid belt, and in the asteroid belt, the asteroids are bumping into each other. And any picture of the asteroid that you see returned by NASA spacecraft or other agency spacecraft, then you, you will inevitably see a, a surface that is then pockmarked uh, or affected by collisional uh, processes. Here, in fact, you can see an impact uh, uh, illustrated uh, uh, and, and, and uh, going on. And I, I should say, I want to thank Dan Durda, who is actually the artist that uh, reconstructed these. Some of these impact events are so uh, catastrophic, the object might actually pull apart and reassemble uh, forming uh, rubble piles. Now, this is a picture of the asteroid belt, okay? Uh, we have the Earth and the Moon. Here's Mars, here's Jupiter, and the asteroid belt is lying between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, asteroids can survive for billions of years in the asteroid belt, up to 4.5 billion years. Every once in a while, those asteroids can migrate or will migrate into these channels. You can see there's these gulps, these gaps. They're called Kirkwood gaps, uh, where asteroids, when they reach those um, positions in the asteroid belt, are affected gravitationally by Jupiter, and their orbits are perturbed. So instead of having a nice circular orbit around the sun, they're perturbed into an elliptical orbit that crosses uh, the orbits of the inner solar system planets like Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury. And once they cross those orbits, they can collide with the planets. So that happened to Chelyabinsk at some point in time and put it on a collision course uh, with Earth. Okay, now, we actually know quite a lot about the asteroids uh, and near-Earth asteroids, uh, to be more precise. We have 50,000 samples of near-Earth asteroids in our collections. Every meteorite's a near-Earth asteroid, okay? So we know something about uh, those, those objects and how they were processed or evolved. In the asteroid belt, we know something about how those objects evolved once they get into Earth-crossing orbits, and we know something about uh, uh, the, the collisional processes when they actually do encounter the Earth. Now, most of those samples, most of those 50,000 samples are what we call ordinary chondrites. 
That's the type of material Chelyabinsk is, is composed of, okay? Now there's three types of ordinary chondrites. There is something called type H, and I'm not gonna worry too much about the distinctions between these. Just understand that there are some compositional differences that suggest they came from three different parent bodies, okay? So there's a type H ordinary chondrites, a type L ordinary chondrites, and a type LL ordinary chondrites. And our analyses and analyses by teams around the world have found that the Chelyabinsk object is derived from the LL parent body. We have almost 6,000 other samples from that parent body, so we can actually piece together a pretty good story about what that um, object experienced. And here, in fact, is a, one, one of those 6,000 samples. This is the Paragol uh, meteorite, and I love this one because, first of all, it's a, it's a large mass. Uh, if you have gone to the uh, uh, Natural History Museum, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and gone to the meteorite exhibit, you've seen it. You may not remember it, but you've seen it. Uh, and you can see here we have relic fragments of the asteroid that were caught up in an impact cratering event on this parent asteroid. And it, like Chelyabinsk, is cross-cut with these dark impact melted uh, shock veins. So in many ways, Paragold has a lot of similarities uh, to Chelyabinsk. Okay. Because we have that collection of meteorites from the same parent body as Chelyabinsk, we can begin to piece together the collisional history of that parent body. And this is something that I've been doing with Tim Swindle at the University of Arizona and a student uh, that Tim had. Uh, we've been analyzing every single impact melted ordinary chondrite or LL ordinary chondrite we can get our hands on. And what we've found is a large number of them were involved in impact cratering events 3.9 to 4.4 billion years ago, okay? Then there's a large gap in our age distribution which suggests there were few impacts on that parent body for a period of about two billion years. And then over the last two billion years, there have been scattered impact events affecting uh, the surface of that object. One of those probably is responsible for jettisoning what became Chelyabinsk, okay? Now, more recently, we can begin to analyze Chelyabinsk itself. Okay, and so here are some data that's just appeared in the literature. Um, our Russian colleagues have determined the age of that black shock melted veins running through the sample were produced in an impact event 4.452 billion years ago, just before the pulse that Tim Swindle and I uh, seen in other samples. One or more other less damaging impact events may have affected uh, the object or the Chelyabinsk material uh, more recently. And there was a final impact in space that occurred about 1.2 billion years ago that uh, Kuni Michizumi and colleagues at Berkeley detected. Uh, and this event exposed what became the surface of Chelyabinsk to space. That is the event that liberated the object that we now know as Chelyabinsk. Okay, so let's now step through the history of this object. We begin nearly 4.56 billion years ago with the formation of molten droplet chondrules in the Sola Nebula. And all of that occurred within the first four million years of solar system history, okay? Those chondrules and other dust particles accreted uh, to form a parent body, the LL chondrite parent body. Uh, and that material was thermally metamorphosed over a period of about 10 million years. Now, based on the thermal metamorphic textures that we actually see in the Chelyabinsk meteorites, we can determine that the Chelyabinsk material used to be buried several kilometers beneath the surface, okay? Large impact cratering event occurred um, uh, on the surface um, about 115 uh, million years ago, and we know that because of the analyses of the shock blackened uh, veins that cross-cut the sample. Analyses of other LL chondrites that um, are associated with Chelyabinsk indicated that that parent body was then hit severely by a large number of impact events between about 4.3 and 3.8 uh, billion years ago. One or two impacts appear to have slightly affected the Chelyabinsk material during the last 500 million years. The meteoroid encountered a gravitational resonance with Jupiter. Its orbit was modified and it became a near-Earth asteroid at that point. And the surface of the Chelyabinsk meteoroid was exposed to cosmic radiation about 1.2 million years ago, suggesting another collisional or fragmentation event. And then, of course, in 2013, earlier this year, uh, it had its final collision uh, with planet Earth. Okay. That's fascinating. Our colleagues in Japan have actually visited a fragment of the same LL chondrite parent body. It's called asteroid Itakawa. Uh, they sent the spacecraft Hayabusa out there. They explored the asteroid. 
they touch down, they collect a little bit of that material and they return it to Earth. And so we can analyze it. We know it is composed of LL chondrite material. So here's the asteroid. The scale is 540 meters across. Uh, for comparison, uh, there's the Orion crew vehicle that's going to carry uh, astronauts uh, beyond low Earth orbit, the moon, asteroids, and, and potentially Mars. Uh, and here's the current uh, International Space Station uh, for scale as well. This is another view of the asteroid. It is a rocky body. Uh, here, for scale, is a boulder on the surface of uh, Itakawa that is 20 meters in size. That is the size of the Chelyabinsk meteoroid. Um, and what's a little bit frightening about that is you suddenly realize there are a lot of potential Chelyabinsk boulders out there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So here's a little orbital diagram that indicates uh, that Itakawa actually is part of the inter uh, asteroid belt. Uh, Chelyabinsk is also part of the inner asteroid belt, although its orbit uh, carried it a little bit uh, farther into the uh, asteroid belt. Now here's a comparison of scale. I want to begin with a picture of what the LL chondrite current body looked like. It was roughly 100 kilometers in diameter. Okay. For a comparison, there's asteroid Itakawa, and I actually I've had to enlarge it by a factor of eight simply so you could see it. Okay, Chelyabinsk events you simply can't see at 20 meters. And this again drives home the point that I mentioned just a moment ago. This object has been fragmented, it's been scattered across space, producing a lot more Itakawas and Chelyabinsk, some of which could potentially hurt Earth uh, in the future. Okay, now I want to say a couple of other things quickly. My minder's over there telling me you're starting to run out of time. Uh, so, but these are, these are important things to understand if you are trying to understand the hazards of future impact events. The first thing I need to explain is, I, I made this point before, that the object that produced Beringer or Meteor Crater in Arizona is very roughly the size of a Chelyabinsk object. Okay, now a lot of newspapers and, and, and pundits and whatnot said, well, Chelyabinsk was half the size of some of these other events that were explosive. Okay, so let's actually explore what that means, half the size or twice the size. So here's Here's a picture, a stony asteroid 20 meters in diameter, okay? Here is an object two times larger, okay? 40 meters in diameter. Although it is two times larger in diameter, it has eight times the volume and eight times the mass if the density is the same, okay? So is it two times or eight times bigger? Okay, now, let's put another twist on that. Those are stony asteroids. What happens if we're looking at an iron asteroid? An iron asteroid, also two times larger, has a higher density. It might have a density of seven grams per cubic centimeter as opposed to two grams per cubic centimeter. So it is twice as large with eight times the volume, but it has 28 times the mass, okay? Now, kinetic energy, that is the explosive nature of of these types of impact events is one half MD squared, one half mass times velocity squared. Okay, so a Chelyabinsk is a 500 kiloton blast. An object with 28 times the mass has 28 times kinetic energy and would produce a 14 megaton blast. That's about what produced Meteor Crater in northern Arizona. So something two times larger can actually be quite a bit more uh, destructive. Now, fearing the worst, um, our community and others at NASA and FEMA and the organizers of the Planetary Defense Conference says, what if something like this were to truly th threaten the Earth in the future? So we ran an exercise earlier this year in April. David Morrison, I think, was there. Uh, it's a fascinating exercise. Everybody uh, in the community was divided up into a series of teams, astronomers trying to detect the orbit and, and so on and so forth. Uh, trying to characterize uh, an asteroid that might be threatening the Earth, uh, a group that looked at mitigation techniques to try to get this thing away from the Earth before it hit. Uh, there was a team that tried to predict what the impact events would be. That was the team that I led. And you can see that there are several other uh, governmental, um, press, space agency, and public uh, teams that were put in a room and tried to work out what, how we would behave and what we would do if something was detected. Okay, so in this exercise, a threat was detected. There was a hypothetical asteroid 2013 PDCE discovered, an 
April 16, 2013. It appeared to be a threatening object, 200 to 300 meters in diameter. The initial probability of impact was 0.08% in 2028, that is about 15 years after discovery. If it were to impact, the velocity was estimated to be 12.4 kilometers per second with an energy equivalent of about 300 megatons of TNT. Note, if the object passed through what astronomers call a keyhole, the certainty of impact would have risen rather dramatically, and that event, if it were to occur, would occur in 2023. Okay, so in this simulation, we're trying to track the orbit, we're trying to better characterize the object, we're trying to predict what it happens, and as, as of 2019, the possible impact points, uh, calculated impact points, lie along what's called a risk corridor, which you can see in a red line crossing across the globe. The possible impact sites include Southeast Asia, the coastal waters of China, Korea and Japan, Siberia and the Arctic Ocean. As orbit is better defined in 2019, the probability of impact has risen to 28%. Now that risk corridor goes around the world and passes directly over London and Paris, two rather populous uh, points on the Earth, before passing over the Mediterranean Sea and Northern Africa. Calculations of impact effect in all those different terrains had to be made to better inform emergency management in the countries along that corridor. Some people were panicking in the room. Other people were taking advantage of the panic. Interesting. Okay, also as of 2019, several missions had been launched to deflect the asteroid and they had all failed. Tensions in the exercise started to go up. There was urgent discussions of nuclear weapons and last ditch attempt to destroy the asteroid. Interestingly enough, some of the uh, countries represented, in fact, some of the countries <coughs> in the target zone did not want to use nuclear weapons because they were so philosophically opposed. The crisis rose in 2022. The probability of impact is now 100%. So the question is simply a matter of where it will occur. As the orbit is increasingly refined, the risk corridor shrinks to Europe and Northern Africa. The impact will occur in the United Kingdom, France, the Mediterranean Sea, or Northern Africa. Uh, and then these questions arise. Do you evacuate people? Are nuclear power stations shut down, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. Uh, then impact occurred at 7, 0700 on 21 November 2029. The impact fortunately occurred in the Mediterranean Sea. Nonetheless, shock waves roll over the surface of southern France. Tsunamis follow crashing onto shorelines around the entire Mediterranean region, et cetera. There's, in general, tremendous devastation, and it is not a good day. We actually learned a lot in that exercise, and we all walked away with a lot of tasks to do, uh, including uh, those uh, with NASA and FEMA. Okay. Now, it's important, a final, to close by uh, looking at, yes, I know, running out of time, um, look at uh, the probability of these impact events and how to prepare them. Uh, in a blue line here, what I'm plotting here, that I actually <coughs> should say Al Harris plotted, and is in an NRC document called Defending Planet Earth, is the impact interval of objects of different sizes. Okay, And as we've said before, smaller objects hit more frequently than bigger objects. Uh, this blue line represents the event that we just simulated, or I showed you in that simulation at the Planetary Defense Conference. This red line represents Chelyabinsk, and you see that a Chelyabinsk-sized event occurs on average once per 10 to 100 years, okay? And I've said that several times, on average, okay? That is the average cadence, but until we've detected all objects, any of these objects, including a mass extinction hypo uh, uh, event, could occur tomorrow. Okay, so it's a, something that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so how do we move forward? Um, to move forward, I want to actually draw your attention to this diagram, which is similar. You'll see that same curve. I've put the impact interval in years from this axis to this axis, and now over here are the number of objects explicitly uh, indicated. Uh, and there's this red curve that Al Harris has put on this diagram. That is the curve illustrating what has been discovered at least as of 2009, and you can see that there is a big gap, okay? So what do we need to do to address 
future hazards. The first thing that I think we need to do is we need to have an environmental assessment of events that have occurred in the geologic past so that we have a foundation to estimate future events. Those events should include all cratering events and those <coughs> air bursts that produce meteoritic and or geologic relics, like meteor crater impact event in northern Arizona. Okay. Simultaneously, we need to have survey programs that are designed to identify potentially threatening objects. And here I'm pointing to this big detection gap. We don't have a very good understanding of the objects of that size. Uh, and here's a little, little factoid. Of the 20 million objects the size of Chelyabinsk, only 500 have been detected so far. Okay. Finally, mitigation concepts should be developed that can be implemented to reduce or completely resolve the hazard of near-Earth object any near-Earth object may pose for Earth. And it's important to understand that the earlier we detect an object that may hit the Earth, the easier it will be to prevent the impact. Okay. Thank you. I'll take some questions now. We'll, we'll take two questions in here and then go to our overflow and see if they have any. And please wait till we bring the mic to you so we make sure it gets picked up on the cameras. Okay. Just a simple question. The composition, yeah. the composition of the uh, any similarity to <laughs> Okay, so the, yeah, so let me repeat the question. The, the question is, uh, what can we say about the composition of the chondrite how, or the, the, the impacting object? How does it compare to the Earth? Okay, the first order Chondritic meteorites, although they have subtle uh, variations in chemistry, have the composition of the sun minus the gases, hydrogen, and helium, okay? And to first order, all of the planets, Earth included, accreted from that same chondritic de debris. So uh, they have a lot of similarities. That is, Chelyabinsk has a lot of similarities to both the sun and to the Earth. Now, I don't want to imply with that very simple answer that the planets all have the same composition. And that's actually interesting. When we do compare the composition of the Earth, Mars, Venus, and so on, they should have started out accreting the same material and have the same composition. And when we find they don't, like Earth and Mars are a little bit distinct, that's a clue that something else interesting is going on. And that's what the planetary science community is spending a lot of time trying to understand. Does anyone here have a question? Yeah, I David, can you, can you comment on the fact that the Chelyabinsk meteorite came in at a very shallow angle and could just as well have come in vertically over a city in terms of how the damage to a city would have been if it had come in straight down? Yeah, uh, you, I showed that plot of the Chelyabinsk trajectory and several other uh, recent uh, um, bolide events in the Earth's atmosphere, and you saw it had a relatively shallow angle. If the object had come in steeper, it would have deposited more of that energy at the Earth's surface based on computer simulations. Many of those are done by uh, Mark Boslow in, in New Mexico at Los Alamos. Um, and therefore, it could have been uh, more destructive. Yeah, so the impact trajectory actually has a bearing on the consequences of the impact event. Do we have any questions in the overflow room? Not at this time. Okay, I'll come back in here. said the 20 million uh, Chelyabinsk size objects, is that all among all asteroids or among near-Earth near asteroids? Uh, that's among all asteroids. The early photos of the damage show factory walls being knocked down. As a simple fix, could building codes uh, be improved and help reduce the damage? Yes, and I would say that uh, buildings in earthquake zones would fare better from this type of impact event than in areas that don't have uh, the, those enhanced um, construction um, uh, techniques in, imposed on them. Um, yes. How did you figure out the history of this thing by just by just looking at those grooves and, and things on there, that was amazing that you figured it out to much detail. How did you do that? Well, 
That's what cosmochemists do. That's what the meteoritical community does. Um, I mean, and, and I, I know that's kind of a glib answer, but literally, that, that's what we've been doing for over 100 years. Um, the, we analyze the mineralogy and the chemistry of all of these objects, and that allows us to identify which meteorites can be grouped together, which meteorites came from the same parent body in the asteroid belt. And in fact, based on the uh, collection of meteorites that we have, it appears that there were in excess of 100 small planets that survived between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Uh, and there's some ideas as to why they didn't accrete to Mars uh, or some of the other planets. And, and in fact, it may have everything to do with the gravitational influence of Jupiter, which didn't allow that, that to occur. But it's based on the mineralogy and the chemistry of these objects. Now, the other part of the, the story that I told you uh, had something to do uh, with um, how deep it was buried. Uh, we can determine that because the, the deeper the object was buried, the hotter it got and the slower it cooled. So that can be equated to a depth. Uh, and then we uh, outlined some of the collisional history of the object. And we're able to determine that because if there is an impact event with sufficient energy, it will reset the radiometric clocks in the rock and so we can determine the age of the new impact rock and then put that together in a collisional sequence. Uh, we have, okay, go ahead. We do have a, call, uh, a question from the overflow room. Yeah, I was interested in the, um, basically the frequency that objects actually survive to impact the surface of the Earth. So say in the last 100 years, what would be an average value for the number of impacts and whether or not that's changed uh, substantially over you know, the past that we know of? Okay. Um, well, it, again, the, the smaller impacting objects occur far more frequently than the small one. Um, and in fact, small meteorite producing impact events are, are pretty darn common. I've done, done this calculation for Texas, and now that I live here, I should. <laughs> but in, in Arizona, where I spent most of my life, uh, the answer was two to three fist-sized meteorites fell in Arizona every year. Okay. Now, larger objects the size of Chelyabinsk, um, they seem to be hitting the, the atmosphere <coughs> somewhere between 10 and 100 years. And I have to say, we can't be more precise for a couple of reasons. One, we don't have a lot of data, uh, and two, that actually can vary quite a lot, even if we did have a lot of data. In fact, I was discussing this very same issue with David Morrison, one of the, our country's most esteemed astronomers, just before the talk. Uh, some of our colleagues will say it's a firm 20, 20 to 30 years. Um, some of us think it's more like 50, 60, 70 years, but it could be a little bit, bit longer. So there's, there is some uncertainty uh, to the answer that I can give you to that question. Now, the other part of that question is, how often these things either cause damage or reach the ground. And there it's very important to understand that the size of the object and the strength of the object is very important when we're talking about these small objects, okay? When we, when we, when we talk about something that is mountainous in size, like, like the 10 kilometer object that produced the Chicxulub crater that wiped out dinosaurs, okay, that object was so big, it, would, it didn't see the atmosphere, it just went <laughs> It's so massive, okay? But smaller objects that are um, both small and weak can catastrophically fragment. Um, a stones, stony asteroids are much weaker than iron asteroids, and so they tend to fragment in the atmosphere more often. And in fact, if you look at the Earth's smallest craters, they are almost exclusively produced by iron, iron asteroids, and that is because the small iron asteroids can reach the surface while the smaller stony asteroids are unable to. And so they burst in the atmosphere. Any more in the overflow? Not at this time, thank you. And we'll take two more. <coughs> um, I heard that uh, the, uh, I don't know if it's the Air Force or the U.S. Uh, uh, um, military have been monitoring things coming through the atmosphere and they have uh, data that they were discussing releasing to astronomers to help provide more data. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Uh, the U.S. government uh, 
we, we refer to that as simply U.S. government censors. We don't talk too much about the, the way in which they do this. Um, I mean, obviously, those of us in the business understand that. But the U.S. government was very forthcoming. Uh, they turned over that data, and the estimate of 500 kilotons explosive energy is consistent with the U.S. government censor data. Now, um, the energy can be um, estimated by several other techniques, one of which, interestingly enough, is a seismic technique that the world deployed as a countermeasure to nuclear weapons tests, okay? So this is deployed nationally uh, so that if a country does detonate against uh, trees and agreements, a nuclear weapon that will be detected. And so that um, system was also employed in, in determining or assessing the energy of the event. <coughs> Most of the meteorites or asteroids that become meteorites Im impact the Earth. Your uh, lecture it gave the asteroid belt as the main source of these com these meteorites that we have. Then we hear I hear about meteorites from Mars that are found in Antarctica are of a different comp composition. How does Mars, when, when did those meteorites come from Mars and how do we know the difference between those and the ones from the asteroid belt? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, meteorites from Mars, and for that matter, meteorites from the moon fascinate people in the meteoritic community because they are, in some sense, free sample return missions, okay? And what, what, what is, what has happened in those cases is asteroids have hit the surface of Mars and hit the surface of the Moon, and some of the material that's ejected in those events that in the crater forming process actually leave with velocities that allow them to escape those planetary gravities. Okay? Then they get into space, and some of that debris, it's a small proportion, but some of that debris will collide with the other planets like the Earth. Uh, and so we do have a wonderful collection of samples from Mars, and we have a wonderful collection of samples from the Moon. Now, the meteorites um, that we understand today came from the Moon were not actually discovered or recognized as being from the Moon until about a decade after the Apollo program shut down. But we, in that case, had all of these wonderful samples that the astronauts had collected brought back to Earth. We identified their very distinct chemistry, and then when we saw a meteorite with the very same chemistry, we said, aha, we know where those come from. Now, the ones on Mars, uh, that was a little trickier puzzle, uh, because of course we've not yet sent a crew, nor even a robotic sample return uh, mission uh, to, to Mars. But in that case, um, the atmosphere of Mars <coughs> had been measured by landers, by fighters, okay? And then we got these samples back on Earth, and some very smart people, some of them, right here at the Johnson Space Center, analyzed some shock melted material within those meteorites and found that some of the atmosphere on their host planet was trapped. And the composition of that trapped gas turned out to be absolutely identical to what was being measured on the surface of Mars. Uh, so that has now been bolstered by a lot of other evidence, but, but we're really confident that we have a really handsome collection of samples from Mars. I have to say, as interesting as those are, those is a very tiny proportion of uh, the meteorites uh, that fall to Earth. I will thank our speaker one more time. And uh, if you have another question, see if you can catch them out in the lobby. restroom is through the door right there or right there. Um, I have a survey online if anybody wants to fill it out. Enjoy your